Now, there's something that I think you need to understand, all of us need to understand, is that there should be an urgency in our lives. In order to truly make this retreat something very powerful and good, we have to have an urgency, and that urgency is that this might be the very last retreat that you ever take. This might be the very last day of your life. Now, we should enter into every Mass as though it were our last. If I was coming up here when I, we started Mass, if I would have been able to whisper in any one of your ears and I would have said, by the way, it's been revealed to me that tonight you will die. How would you attend this Mass? How would you pray the Our Father? How would you receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord knowing that this would be the very last time you would ever receive him? That's the way I want you to enter into this retreat, as though it were your last and only retreat, that it was the last day of your life, not the first. People get caught up in, you know, that old phrase, oh, today is the first day of the rest of your life. No, today may be the last day of the rest of your life, so you may as well do something good with it. And so what I want to do is, because we are celebrating the feast, really, this, of our Blessed Mother in Saturday, I think it's important to see what she's given us. And as evangelists, we realize that she's absolutely essential in evangelizing. Because the f whole first part of Scripture in the New Testament comes from Mary. It says very clearly that she pondered these things in her heart. And all of these things about the childhood of Jesus, the the, when Jesus was an infant, his childhood, his young adult years, this all came from Mary. Mary teaches us so much. We have to open ourselves to her. Because you see, Mary teaches us from the very get-go. She knew that the mother of the Messiah would be the, the mother of the suffering servant. She wasn't some foolish virgin. Many of the virgins wanted to be, oh, they wanted to be the mother of the Messiah. And you know why? Because they were hoping for the king, the one that was going to come and destroy the enemies of Jerusalem and reestablish the kingdom. And the, always the mother was the queen, not a wife. It was the mother. That's why they, all the women wanted to, be, wanted to be the mother of the Messiah. There were groups of women yearning, praying for that because they wanted the different coming. Mary was the only virgin who knew that the Messiah to come would be the suffering servant, that he would be a leper and she would be the mother of a leper. And yet she said yes to the angel. Fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum. Be it done unto me according to thy word. And she embraced the cross, the sufferings of her son. That took a lot of guts at 15 years old, a lot of courage. So what does she do? As soon as she receives the message of the angel, she conceives in her womb, and if she had a cripple camel, she got to the hill country of Judea by the evening. And what does Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, now anytime you find anyone filled with the Holy Spirit, it means that God is speaking. These are direct words from God. And filled with the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth says, how is it? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. Now here Mary starts teaching us right away again. No woman was considered a mother unless she gave live birth. No pregnant woman was called a mother. And here you have the Holy Spirit revealing that Mary, within hours of the beginning of gestation, was already the mother of her Lord and Savior. So we know that human life, by, ordained by God, begins from the moment of conception. Proof right in Scripture. But you see, we're slow, and so sometimes it has to be repeated. So God repeated it, but in a different way through Elizabeth. She says, the moment your voice sounded in my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Joy is a human response. Animals don't have joy. A cat is happy when it hears the can open. A, door is, a dog is happy when it hears the car door slam when you get home. But they don't have joy. Only human beings can have joy. And it says that John, in the womb of his mother, experienced, leapt for joy. Then we see Mary, and we see them fleeing. They're fleeing. They're not fleeing. They're actually going for a census. And they're on their way, suffering terrible hardships. It says, it doesn't say that there was no room for them in the inn. That's misreading scripture. There was no suitable place. Mary had, there were rooms, but what are the rooms? The rooms were in a caravanassery, and they would have had to sleep next to other groups of people. And their belongings would be in the center that was open to the stars. 
This was unacceptable for Mary. What was acceptable was a barn, a barn, a, a stable. You know what's in stables? If anybody in their right mind at Christmas time would come from another planet or a, a place that didn't know Christ, and they walked into your living room and they'd say, what in heaven's name do you have a barn on your table for? They wouldn't have any clue. What made that barn beautiful? What made it desirable was the fact that Mary was there. She's the one who made that place beautiful. And that's exactly why he was born in a stable. Because you and I are that barn. You and I are that stable. I've been, I've worked on farms before. You got a lot of cow flops and you got sheep doodles and horse apples and God, heaven knows what. And you'd say, what a horrible place. But yet, since Mary is there, it's beautiful. It's desirable by God. Remember, when God created Mary, he exhausted the obediential potency of creaturehood. That means that he exhausted himself when he created her. He could not have created her even slightly more perfect than he did. She would have ceased to be human. And so this is our mother. And so what else do we see? We see the gifts of the wise guy, the wise men. They bring gold. One king knew that he was a king. Another one bring frankincense. He knew that he was God. You only brought incense to God. And the other one, you'd almost think, was a little bit touched in the head. He brings myrrh. You know what that would be like? That would be like if I was invited to the christening of a baby and I brought a baby casket. That's what it would be like. He brought the oils that he would be bathed in at his death. So that king knew that this child came to die. This is all revealed by Mary. We wouldn't have any of this without Mary. And then we see Mary during the life of Jesus. We see the presentation in the temple. We see Mary coming up and holding the baby Jesus up to the Father. And you know why she did that? Because you see, it was a custom in the times of Jesus that the mother, every father had a throne. Every dad had a throne. Especially, you know, Joseph was probably the rightful heir to the throne of David. So he should have been the king of Israel if the kingdom would, have, would not have been destroyed by Rome. And so what the father would do with every firstborn boy, he would sit down on his throne. Every old man has a throne. Every grandpa I've ever met has a, has a throne. That's that one chair that you can't touch. Even though the springs are poking him in the backside, don't you touch my chair. He's going to stay in that chair even if it kills him. And that's his throne. Well, every father, every man in Rome, in, in Israel, had his own throne. And so what happened was the mother, after the purification, would process into the home with the baby, and the father would be sitting in his throne, and the mother would kneel before the father and raise the baby up to the father. Now, the tradition was that the, fa the father took the baby, raised the baby up, and then placed the baby on his knee, the firstborn boy, and only then did the child become an heir to the throne of David and a member of the tribe. So Mary had to bring Jesus before his father, and Joseph wasn't. And so that's why we see Mary holding the baby up to his father, the holy of holies, Simeon, the last from the old, comes in, filled with the Holy Spirit. My eyes have seen the salvation of the people of Israel. And he looks at this child, and he takes the baby in his arms, and he says, this child shall be the rise and the fall of many. And then he turns to Mary and he says, and you, woman, same exact term used for Eve. He says, and you, woman, a sword will pierce your heart. If he would have stopped there, what mother doesn't weep over her children, especially her firstborn? But he didn't. He said, a sword will pierce your heart so that the thoughts of men will be revealed. Now, this is a prophecy that must be fulfilled before the end of the New Testament. We hear this through Mary, through her words. And so we find the life of Christ. We find that he's, he's not only was offered to his father, but then we find a Jesus in his public life. We see how Jesus points at her. Who is my mother? Who is my father? When Mary shows up, he's the one who does the will of my father. In other words, 
It was through the obedience to my Father's will that I'm even here, that you have salvation. And then we find him, we find him at Cana. We find Mary at Cana. Now, this is interesting because what happens is whenever Mary asks for something, it's always the best. You can get things from Jesus, but not the best. See, Mary said they have no more wine. Well, he brought 12 guys. You know, they could pound at home. You know that. And so they ran out of wine. And you know, what, weddings lasted for seven days. And you had a party hardy throughout the entire seven days. And so, of course, they ran out of wine. Now, Mary says they have no more wine. And then says, just do what he tells you. In other words, whatever you bring to Mary, that's exactly what's going to happen. And what, they, what does he do? He creates not only the wine, but the best wine. That's what happens with Mary. She will always get us the best. In fact, I tell you this emphatically. It is impossible to love Jesus the way he wants to be loved, but through Mary. It's the only way we can love him truly, worthily. And then we find Mary at the cross. We know that there is where the prophecy of Simeon is finally fulfilled. Jesus' heart explodes out of love. That's the only way a heart can contain water and blood. The heart beats in such a way and it fills up so it's the size of a soccer ball. An electrical shock then rips the heart in two and the blood separates from the water. And Mary is standing there. And the soldier comes and he breaks the legs of the soldier on the left of Jesus. He cries out in agony and he, he goes and he breaks the legs of the thief on the right of Jesus. He screams out in agony. And then we see him go toward Jesus. And Mary places herself before the body of her son and said, please, for the love of God, can't you see that he's dead? He has never hurt anyone. He made the, the deaf hear, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers cured. He raised people from the dead. Please, I beg of you, don't break his legs. And while she is pleading for the body of her son, the soldier on the horse takes his lance and he thrusts it into the side of Jesus. And out gushed water and blood. Water spewed the blood and water flowed out of him, covering those who were standing near the cross. There is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Simeon. A sword will pierce your heart. She suffered it. And he bears it in his risen body as a witness that she participated in our redemption. We are to evangelize we must let people know the importance and the absolute necessity of Mary and that wound in the side and that prophecy of Simeon because only the Catholic Church will ever repeat that story of the prophecy of Simeon. That's why they take Christ off the cross because that wound in the side bespeaks clearly and undeniably about the, the participation of Mary in our redemption. She is co-redemptrix. She is the mediatrix of grace. For all grace comes to us through her. For Christ Jesus is all grace. That is who we celebrate today. We celebrate Mary as our beloved mother. And she is a mother who is alive and lives and is a certain distance from us. She died and was resurrected and assumed into heaven. And therefore, she is with Jesus, who also has his body in heaven. And so our mother is a true mother. Our Lord is our true brother, our true Savior. And so look to Mary. Seek her dispositions in everything that you do as, a, as an evangelist and as a Catholic. Love her and you will love Christ. Honor her and you will be honoring Jesus. There is no way you can get around it. For those who honor the mother will always fall more deeply in love with the son. It is a necessity. And so look to Mary for everything. Not just on Saturdays when we celebrate the memorial of Mary, but every day of our lives, which begin our day with Mary, end our day with Mary, and all throughout the day, our lives will be that of Christ. As Jesus was formed in the womb of Mary, so you and I must be formed in the heart of Mary. We must embrace her to become Jesus. Do not settle for imitation. Become Jesus, become his presence, become his kindness, become his mercy, become his forgiveness, become his presence 
settle for nothing less. Your hand must be his hand. Your voice must be his voice. Your feet must make every place you go his. Your love must be his. Don't, for the love of God, settle for anything less. And keep that urgency within your heart, realizing that you only have today. And if we do only have today, then we must live for now and love for now.